Fantastic Fungi is a pop science documentary about the ecology, evolutionary history, and alleged therapeutic benefits of mushrooms. It features beautiful time-lapse footage of growing mushrooms and beautiful real-time footage of a man named Paul Stamets, an amateur mycologist, an enthusiast who studies and sells fungi. Stamets loves mushrooms and claims they have massive untapped potential in supplementation, psychedelic self-actualization, and preventing ecological collapse. He even ventures to say that fungi, mushrooms, molds, and their complex underground fiber systems are intelligent. Intelligence is a concept that does not have a precise definition. There is even disagreement over how to define intelligence among animals with brains, and controversy over how to measure intelligence in humans. Intelligence can be defined as the ability to obtain, store, and use information. Taking it a step further, we can also say intelligence includes understanding that information. For humans, the brain is responsible for intelligence. Intelligence is said to be an emergent property as a result of the activities of cells in the brain. Emergence is a term used to describe complex systems that are made up of simple constituent parts. It's a fancy way of saying this thing is very complicated and I don't really understand how it works. In the case of the brain, the brain cells are the simple constituent parts, and the emergent property is its ability to acquire, process, and use information. Another example of emergence is water. The constituent parts of water are water molecules, and the emergent property is wetness. A single water molecule isn't wet, but wetness emerges from the physical and chemical interactions of those molecules in a drop of water. Generally, systems with emergent properties have high quantities of simple components that are subject to change and respond to information. Looking at the brain and intelligence, we can see this play out. The brain and nerves are made up of billions of cells called neurons. A single neuron isn't intelligent, but a high enough quantity of neurons can be. Quantity leads to quality in this case. Compared to the entire brain, a neuron is relatively simple. A single neuron can be thought of as a generalist. It has the potential to be involved in many different tasks. If each neuron was assigned a hyper-specialized, pre-programmed task, the brain wouldn't be able to learn any new information or skills. In emergent systems, we see elements of randomness and mutability. Neurons form many redundant and unnecessary connections with other neurons. There isn't intentionality to how they form connections, but some of those random connections may prove useful and adaptive, leading to learning and creativity. Neurons are also responsive to information. A single neuron can receive connections from many other cells, and through local interactions with neighboring cells can form stronger connections that facilitate learning. A single neuron is stupid, but a high quantity of simple neurons making random connections and using information to strengthen adaptive connections results in an intelligent brain. So how does this happen? Brain cells act like wires that fire electric currents. These wires communicate with each other in a network. Each neuron receives input from cells or the environment and fires an electric current, which results in the release of signal to other cells. This signal alters the electrical activity of the next neuron. Whenever a thought, behavior, sensation, or feeling occurs in the brain, networks of cells will adjust their electrical firing rate. Certain collections of neurons are responsible for specific functions in the brain. Some may be involved in understanding Portuguese, others in sight, and others in feeling anger. A neuron can get excited, causing it to fire more, or inhibited, causing it to fire less. When a neuron fires quickly, when it gets excited, it will release chemicals to alter the electrical firing rate of the next neuron, sending a signal that will continue down the network of wires. With repeated stimulation, these chemical signals change the connectivity of the neurons. When a neuron consistently sends signals to another, it strengthens the connection between the two cells. By inducing the formation of more signal receptors, causing the release of more signal, and by growing more points of connection. Cells that fire together, wire together. Memories are typically the result of neurons forming strong connections with each other. This is how we learn and how we develop habits. Practice and repetition cause specific neurons to fire, and when they fire more often, the connections become stronger. As we age, redundant neural pathways get pruned. Unnecessary connections between neurons are cleared. This reinforces adaptive connections, connections that are involved in a growing intellect. As neural connections are reinforced, information, ideas, thought patterns, and habits become cemented. At the same time, with the right inputs and deprivations, the brain is adaptable. Thanks to the quantity, simplicity, 
mutability, and responsivity of neurons, their collective action leads to information acquisition, processing, implementation, and understanding. Are brains the only systems that can be intelligent, or are there other systems with the ability to gather, store, and react to information? Ants, wasps, bees, and termites are insects that live in complex colonies which can accomplish feats a single insect couldn't dream of achieving on its own. A single ant is stupid, but a large collection of ants can exhibit what is called swarm intelligence. Leafcutter ants have complex colonies that cut fragments of leaves to grow a fungal crop. The fungi grow nodules that provide all the nutrients needed by the ants. Other species of ants have domesticated aphids which feed on plants and excrete a sweet butthole nectar for the ants to enjoy. These ants will herd the aphids to greener pastures, shade them, and attack any predators looking to cull their livestock. In leaf cutters, every ant in the colony will specialize to a particular role. One role is to remove waste and dead ants by storing them in a large, deep underground chamber to prevent the infection of the crop. Other roles include foragers that look for and cut leaves, gardeners slash nurses that tend to the fungi and larvae, excavators that dig out the tunnels, large soldiers that protect the colony from invading army ants, and of course the queen who lays eggs. Now the queen's job is only to lay eggs. She is not a central authority. The queen has no say in how the colony operates. She does not bark orders or carry out a grand plan. Much like the organization of neurons in the human brain, ant society is decentralized. They answer to no one. No single insect has knowledge of the global project of the swarm. Ants use pheromones to carry out their tasks, local chemical signals that they can detect and that can trigger changes in behavior. An individual ant is not capable of much on its own. It is estimated that a single ant is only capable of about 20 different simple behaviors. Looking at a single individual ant, the insect doesn't seem to have much agency or accuracy in its movements which can be erratic and at times aimless. But many ants together can form directed paths to food or to the nest, despite the seemingly undisciplined movements of individuals. How does this happen? When an ant finds food, it releases a pheromone that attracts other ants, which may still move erratically, but will overall meander closer to the direction of the pheromone. Other ants will squirt pheromone on their way to the food source. This leads to a positive feedback loop, more ants become attracted to the path, and the more ants on the path, the more attractive pheromone is farted out. Shorter paths to food source lead to more pheromone release, so that the overall ant paths are strengthened. One can draw a comparison to the neural circuits being strengthened by synaptic growth in active networks. The random movement of individual ants allows them to stumble upon new food sources, sparking nucleation events for the formation of new and possibly beneficial ant paths. A single ant doesn't seem to have much autonomy or foresight. They have very stereotyped behaviors and seem to follow pheromones with an almost blind obedience. It is even possible for a foraging party to get trapped in an ant mill, a spiral of ants following each other in a pheromone-induced vicious cycle. Ant mills are rare events, small inconsequential blips in the overall efficiency of the colony. Ants that encounter impassable gaps will slow down. When an ant steps on another's back, this sends a signal to that ant to stop moving. This continues until the ants form a bridge across the gap, and with time, the bridge can shorten the gap and create a more efficient route to the food source on the other side. This indirect coordination is how these insects build nests and hives. African termites will place mud balls in random spots at first, leaving behind pheromones where they dropped their clump of dirt. Other termites place mud balls where the pheromones are, and eventually enough mud balls are placed in roughly the correct spot to build a massive termite mound with complex ventilation systems and specialized chambers. So, are these insect swarms intelligent? The individuals of a colony obtain information by sensing obstacles in their environment, food, contact with other ants, and pheromones. Colonies can store information about food location in ant trails, which are reinforced by the building accumulation of pheromones. And these insects use this information to build complex nests, make bridges, grow crops, and optimize paths to and from the nest. So, by our permissive definition, an ant mound is somewhat intelligent. But ants have brains, and brains have neurons. 
What about species that don't have neurons? Species like mushrooms, molds, and yeasts comprise a group called fungi that are more closely related to humans than plants. Many species of fungi form a complex root-like system of thin, branching fibers within the soil. These fuzzy, thread-like networks are called mycelium. These strands are used to digest nutrients from the soil. Many mushrooms can sprout from a single mycelial mat. Mushrooms are the above-ground fruiting bodies of a mycelial network, sort of like how an apple is the fruiting body of an apple tree. These fruiting bodies disperse spores which allow the fungus to reproduce. When spores begin to germinate, they send signals that are received by other spores in the soil and grow towards each other, eventually fusing and exchanging resources. Many species of fungi grow their underground fiber networks in close contact with the roots of plants, forming a symbiotic relationship between plant and fungus. Living organisms need carbon and nitrogen to survive. Plants are able to fix carbon via photosynthesis, and fungi are able to draw nitrogen from the soil. Fungal networks benefit both species by allowing the fungus to steal some carbon in exchange for nitrogen. You scratch my roots, I'll scratch yours. This network can be very complex, and a fungal net can connect the roots of many plants and allow communication between the plants, creating a wood wide web. This series of tubes shuttles nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus between plants. About 80% of land plant species have this sort of symbiotic relationship with fungi. The branches of these fungal fibers are one cell thick, and their ends often have many differing nuclei. In humans, most cells have compartments called nuclei that contain genes that are identical to almost every cell in the body. Genes code for proteins, molecules that carry out functions in the cell, leading to traits. In fungi, fibers can fuse with other fibers and transfer nuclei to other cells. Some cells can have two genetically distinct nuclei, which can divide and spread those new genes down the fiber. This diversity of nuclei, and therefore genes expressed, can select for specific characteristics in specific regions, for example, resistance to a toxin or enzymes that better digest food in the soil. Branches with genes that help them encounter food and are able to withstand the onslaught of toxins and disease are reinforced while others wither away. Advantageous adaptive fiber tracts are strengthened while useless ones atrophy, just like neural projections and ant paths. The fungal network can improve plant survivorship, growth, and even facilitate plant-to-plant -plant communication. A study has found that if a plant is damaged by an insect, it can send signals to another plant via the network so that the other plant can respond by improving defenses. If the fungal fibers between the plants are severed, the other plant does not get the signal and does not respond. Suzanne Simard, an ecologist at the University of British Columbia, has discovered that older trees will use fungal networks to shuttle nutrients to younger seedling trees. She has also demonstrated that trees from different species will share nutrients around cooperatively. For instance, conifer trees that do not lose their needles during the winter will share carbon with birch trees, and will later call in the favor during seasons when the birch has carbon to spare. Some species of the symbiotic fungus have pores between the cells and their branching mycelial fiber tracts. At any given time, most of these pores are closed, and the web can open specific channels to allow transport of nutrients and signals down specific branches, allowing for directed communication between trees. So, are these mycelial networks intelligent? Well, fungi can obtain information by encountering signals in the soil, store that information by reinforcing the adaptive branches, and use that information to form complex symbiotic relationships with plants. Some say that the forests themselves are intelligent, thanks to the fungal networks. Another organism said to possess intelligence is the humble slime mold. A slime mold is a single-celled, oozing mass that doesn't fit into the categories of plant, animal, or fungus. There are many species of slime mold, but the one we are going to focus on is Physarum polycephalum. This branching snot entity can be seen growing in damp forest environments, often on decaying vegetation or wood. Using the same proteins we have in our muscles, slime molds can contract regularly to distribute their biomass across their entire body. When a part of the slime mold senses food, it relaxes, and the rest of the biomass is distributed to that area. This reinforces branches that have found food. 
A Japanese scientist named Toshiyuki Nakagaki found that slime molds grown in a dish can determine the fastest way to get out of mazes, and the most efficient way to organize a subway system, so long as there's the delicious reward of oats to incentivize them. The pathways established by the slime mold very closely resembled the plan of the Tokyo subway system engineered by humans. The slime mold can obtain information by detecting food, store that information in the layout of its branches, and use that information to distribute its goo in ways to find more food. Let's go even further down the evolutionary tree. Bacteria are smaller and less complex than even a single human cell. A single bacterium is even stupider than an ant, dare I say stupider than a slime mold. Yet many of these simple germs can do interesting things in the aggregate. Many species of bacteria have the ability to sense the population density of other bacteria in their colony or surroundings using chemical signaling. Bacteria release chemicals and can respond to certain chemicals by moving or turning on or off genes. At a certain threshold, at a certain density of bacteria, if exposed to enough chemical signals, the bacteria in a colony can change their behavior in advantageous ways. Like ants and neurons, colonies of bacteria act as a decentralized system when responding to environmental stimuli. There is no single germ leading the charge. The power emerges from the collective. Alivibrio fisheri is a bacteria species that live inside of a special organ in a squid. At night, the squid hunts in the open water, looking like a scrumptious morsel for any keen-eyed predator. To camouflage, the squid's undersides shine in a way that resembles the moon reflecting off the ocean's surface, allowing it to hide in plain sight and avoid getting eaten. This shine is thanks to the A. fisheri bacteria living in its organ. With time, the bacteria divide, and at night, the density of bacteria spewing chemicals reaches critical mass, turning on the genetic switch in each bacterium to produce a protein that induces a chemical reaction that releases light. That light allows the squid to camouflage in the moonlight. During the day, the squid evacuates his organ of much of the bacteria, thereby lowering the number of bacteria releasing chemical signal below threshold. So the gene is turned back off and the light isn't produced and the squid doesn't shine during the day. Not all bacteria are so benevolent, however. Many infectious bacteria will secrete toxins when enough exist in one place so that they quote unquote know they can take on the host. Cystic fibrosis is a respiratory illness caused by a mutation on a gene which normally thins mucus in the lungs. In typical lungs, cells keep the mucus flowing and remove pathogens. With the cystic fibrosis mutation, the body is unable to release water into the mucus, making it too thick and viscous for normal function. Bacteria then accumulate in the stagnant mucus. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a species of bacteria that thrives in cystic fibrosis lungs. As the bacteria accumulate, the amount of chemical signal they release rises above the tipping point, and the bacteria begin to clump together and secrete a slimy ooze that protects them from the immune system. They also make toxins which kill lung tissue. This infection can lead to pneumonia, respiratory failure, and death. Antibiotics are drugs that kill bacteria. Occasionally, a bacterium will get a mutation that allows it to survive a particular antibiotic. That cell will divide while others perish, and eventually a new colony will grow from the ashes of its fallen comrades, able to fend off the antibiotic threat. In some cases, this process can be enhanced by bacteria picking up bits of DNA with the helpful antibiotic resistance mutation in the environment, or by directly transferring a copy of the helpful DNA to another bacterium. This adaptive strategy allows nasty bacterial infections to evade treatment or natural immunity. This same principle applies to tumors and viruses. Cancer is caused by normal cells accumulating mutations that make the cell divide uncontrollably, taking resources away from healthy tissue and causing the formation of tumors. As cancer gets worse, it mutates. With enough mutations, the cancer can go into the bloodstream and spread to other parts of the body. It metastasizes. Thanks to mutations, cancer adapts to the new environments, and like bacteria, can adapt to evade treatment. This is taken to the extreme in Tasmanian devils. Tasmanian devils are undergoing an epidemic of an infectious facial tumor. All tumors found in these devils are genetically identical. The tumor is not caused by a toxin or a virus. It is a clonally transmissible cancer. 
meaning it is a cluster of cancer cells that can be transferred between individual devils. The cancer isn't just spreading within the body of one devil, it's spreading throughout the population. Tasmanian devils often bite each other on the face, and this behavior allows the cancer cells to spread from one devil to another via the mixing of their blood. Cancer cells, that originated from healthy body cells, mutated into their own entity, infecting devils like a virus. Speaking of viruses, this is why we see different variants emerge during the COVID-19 pandemic. Viruses can mutate, just like bacteria and tumors. Not all mutations are beneficial. Some are even fatal for the virus. But with enough rapidly spreading viral particles, some will accumulate mutations that allow them to infect host cells quicker, or allow them to escape the wrath of the immune system. These variants have outsmarted human society. So that makes disease intelligent as well. Bacteria can take in information by sensing their quorum, the population density of their environment via chemical signaling. Information is stored in bacterial colonies, tumors, and viral populations via the mutations of surviving members, and that information is used to resist treatment and immunity. Lucky for us, our immune system can be just as adaptive. The immune system is our body's way of preventing disease. It uses specialized cells to detect any foreign material in the body, such as a bacterium, virus, tumor, or parasite, and dispose of it. This works because our body makes a diverse range of immune cells that recognize proteins on the surface of invaders. Immune cells recognize these foreign proteins using special receptors. The receptor acts by physically binding to the germ surface protein. This causes the immune cell to divide rapidly, making more copies of that particular protein receptor that can recognize that particular germ. It also makes cells that create antibodies which, like the receptor, bind directly to that germ surface protein. These antibodies cluster on the surface of the germ, immobilizing it and allowing it to be killed by immune cells. Vaccines make use of the same system by introducing the surface protein to the body, leading to the formation of antibodies. The immune system makes a diverse range of cells with different receptors by mutating the genes for the receptor in immune cells. Mutations in the gene lead to physical changes in the receptor, which may allow the receptor to bind to a different protein. Your body makes so many immune cells that virtually any surface protein can be bound by some receptor on some immune cell. Swimming around in your fluids, there is already a cell capable of making antibodies against COVID, or the flu, or Ebola, or the bubonic plague, or duck hepatitis, or feline AIDS. Many of these immune cells are completely useless, making receptors that target diseases you will never get, or proteins that don't exist on any disease, or proteins that simply don't exist, period. Immune cells that make proteins targeting your own cells are wiped out to prevent bodily harm. Any immune cell that encounters its protein target is amplified by cell division, creating memory cells in the blood that make it more likely the cell will encounter the protein again. The immune system obtains information by binding to proteins expressed by pathogens, stores that information by creating many copies of that cell that targets the disease, and uses that information that make antibodies that neutralize the threat. It's as if the mutational intelligence of viruses, bacteria, and tumors are caught in an intellectual battle of wits with the immune system. And these two intelligent entities are duking it out inside of a body controlled by the intelligent entity that is your brain. According to this framework, there are multiple intelligent systems coexisting inside of you right now. But is that fair to say? The question of intelligence is largely semantic. Our definition of intelligence can be altered to describe any adaptive system you want. All these systems acquire, store, and respond to information. They are all made up of a massive quantity of cells or genes following simple rules, gathering and adapting to information. If we want to refine our definition, we can ask if they understand what they're doing. Humans, and presumably other animals with developed brains, consciously understand what they are doing. So when we say a fungal colony or an ant swarm is intelligent, there's this implication that their actions are deliberate, that they have some sort of plan of what they're going to be doing, as if they are aware of their surroundings. These behaviors of these species could just be the consequence of cause and effect, chemical and physical processes devoid of any conscious awareness. One could make the argument that since these colonies can process information in ways similar to the human brain, and that the human brain is conscious, why wouldn't they also share the trait of consciousness? Are fungi conscious? Is there something that it is to be like a portobello mushroom? Do they have plans for the future? Do they feel pleasure or pain? 
The thing is, how consciousness exists at all is a famously mysterious problem. We don't really know why it is that humans are conscious, so trying to figure out if other entities are conscious will be even more difficult without a baseline. Integrated information theory, proposed by neuroscientist Giulio Tononi, is one of the leading scientific and mathematical frameworks to explain consciousness. Integrated information theory postulates that a system that integrates information while processing it is more likely to be conscious. Dr. Tononi claims that a system that processes distributed information together is conscious, while information that is processed in isolation is not conscious. Unifying information leads to experience. Fragmenting information does not. Experiments on sleeping and awake subjects demonstrate this idea of integration in the brain. Neurons in the brain send signals via electrical impulses, and electrical currents are related to magnetic fields. A magnet can be used to induce an electric current. So, directed magnetic pulses in a region of the brain will cause neurons to fire electrical pulses. In an experiment on sleeping subjects, volunteers who were unconscious, the magnetic pulse excited neurons locally and disappeared quickly. On subjects who were awake, subjects who were conscious, the pulse reverberated across distant brain regions. When awake, neurons are integrated, and this allowed the pulse to spread across the brain. While in deep sleep, neurons are not integrated, so the pulse remains transient and local. We see this reflected in brain anatomy as well. The cerebellum, the quote-unquote small brain at the back of the head, has a very large number of neurons. Those neurons tend to connect locally in disconnected, fragmented modules. People can actually survive with this entire region totally removed, without major impairment to their consciousness. The cortex, however, the large, folded outer rind of the brain, has neurons that are highly connected and networked across many regions. Likewise, damage to the highly integrated cortex can be devastating to consciousness, leading to cognitive impairments or coma. Consciousness in this framework is not a switch. The more integrated the information, the more conscious the experience. Integrated information theory also disagrees with the philosophy that if you simulate the exact function of the brain, if you create a perfect simulation of every brain connection, that simulation would be conscious. Integrated information states that the output of the simulation does not matter if the simulation itself is not integrated in its processing of information. For instance, seeing the word apple evokes memories of the times you've seen an apple. The image and the word are processed at once, unified as a concept. Neurons associated with the word and the visual image of the apple are networked together. On the other hand, a computer may have a file with the image of an apple, and have a separate text file where the word apple appears. The computer doesn't know these concepts are associated, and whenever it retrieves a file, it processes them independently. If the computer does not integrate information, it isn't conscious. If you upload your brain into a computer that doesn't integrate information, according to Dr. Tononi, even if the simulation is utterly convincing to an outsider, behaving exactly like the physical meat version of you, your virtual self will simply be an empty husk, a philosophical zombie devoid of consciousness. While compelling to some, the integrated information theory of consciousness is widely viewed as incomplete, needing refinement, and not without criticism. Ultimately, we still don't know why the physical properties of the human brain lead to the phenomenological experiences of understanding. Besides, what if fungi are intelligent by a totally different mechanism, in ways beyond our understanding? Could a determined beehive reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics? Could a patch of lichen solve the hard problem of consciousness? Does a shadowy cabal of coniferous trees influence our daily lives more than we could ever realize? Whether or not systems without brains have intentionality or consciousness remains to be seen. So, to reiterate, single neurons are dumb, like an individual ant, mycelium branch, bacterium, cancer cell, virus, or immune cell. Each neuron has branching, searching behaviors, just like foraging ants, growing mycelium fibers, and oozing slime mold tracts. Neurons can create redundant connections, much like the random mutations of bacteria, tumors, and viruses, or like the random receptors created by immune cells. Neurons reinforce useful connections, in a very similar way to the pheromone-mediated positive feedback loops of ant paths, or the distributed biomass of successful slime mold branches, or the survival of adaptive mutants, and the amplification of disease-recognizing immune cells. 
So it's evident that eusocial insect colonies, mycorrhizal networks, slime molds, bacterial colonies, tumors, viral populations, and the adaptive immune system are capable of obtaining, storing, and using information. The question that is still unanswered is if any of them understand information. And that's it. That's all I got. This is the end. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.